Well, our scripture today is from 1 Corinthians. It is known as the love chapter, read often at weddings. Uh, It's not about a married couple. Uh, It is particularly about the church. And uh, believe it or not, the church wasn't getting along. So we're going to pick up here at the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the prophetic powers and understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions, And I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes in all things, and endures all things. Love never ends, but for prophecies they will come to an end, as for tongues they will cease, as for knowledge it will come to an end, for we know only in part and we prophesy only in part, but when the end comes, the partial comes to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. And for now, faith, hope, and love abide. But these three, the greatest of these is love. And we continue this week with the reading from the book of Luke. It is where Jesus is in his hometown, reading in the synagogue. Upon finishing his reading, uh, the local people get upset with Jesus. I pick up here in the fourth chapter, verse 21. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you doing in Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except the widow at Zephyrin in Sidon. There were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed except Nahum the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. Well, Paul had a problem at the church in Corinth. And the problem in the church was simply this. There had been given lots of gifts to everyone. Uh, different spiritual gifts, gifts of tongues, gifts of healing, uh, all sorts of different gifts. And then amazingly, everybody decided to start comparing their gifts with one another and started to brag and boast about themselves. I know that's hard to imagine. 
But if you will for a moment, and then the teachers and the preachers begin to also pile on, and this preacher is better than that preacher, or this, can, can, can you picture this for just a moment? That there was a little bit of pride creeping in, a little bit of pride got to larger pride, and then all of a sudden everybody was claiming how great everybody was at something, and soon the church lost its witness of being the church and began to look like the world. The church began to look like the world instead of looking like the church. And so Paul calls them back into accountability with this Scripture. He brings them back into accountability and says, this is not the way it's supposed to be. While you may have these great gifts, it looks really ugly the way you're living it out. When we first finished at seminary, we arrived at Kingwood for an anniversary present. Our anniversary just happened the other day. We graduated in December. I bought a grandfather clock for Deb and I. She had always wanted one, so I went and bought it at a second-hand store. Estate sales are great places to get a grandfather clock. And I had brought it home, and I had set it up. And do you know something about these things? They gong a lot. <laughs> Did y'all know that? Like every quarter hour. And then, God bless you, when it's midnight, right? Like 12 times, yeah. And then there's a song before that. I'm probably gonna, there's probably going to be an argument after church. Somebody loves there, somebody doesn't. And if you're trying to watch the news, you can't quite hear it. And here's my observation about these clocks. They're beautiful, they're wonderful. You wind them up. Beautiful things and a, and a great memory of it. But boy, do they make a lot of noise. And they do not have ears. No, they don't, do they? They can make noise, but they don't have ears. Now, don't call out anybody's name that you're thinking about right now. But people can be this way too, can't we? We, we can speak a lot, but never hear anything. A clock is designed only to tell us what time it is, but at some point it just becomes a gonging thing. As humans, we have a lot more input areas than we do output. We have ears, we have touch, we have sight. We have lots of ways that we can be transformed because we're not like a clock. We, we can be changed. Now, I think all too often as humans, what we would prefer to do is we would prefer to have the world adjust to us so that we could go just along the way we're going. A lot of times we're like the clock, we're making a lot of noise because we prefer the world around us to adjust to the way I want to live. Now maybe I'm just talking about me and none of y'all have this affliction. But there is this thing where we are to be transformed and Christ says it. Put on my mind, put on my heart to be transformed in the likeness of Christ. If we have no ears and all we have is a mouth, then we can't be transformed. And truthfully, as we look at this 1 Corinthians verse, what it is about, you may not know it, it is an argument put forth about the idea of being transformed by love. Now, this first section, I'll ask David real quickly, I think is hyperbole, uh, where uh, an argument is taken to is its extreme, and then from that you deduce where you need to be. Is that, is that what a hyperbole is? Thank you, David. So he'll correct me later if I'm wrong. He's always good when y'all are here. So... If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but I do not have love. Now, I'm going to let you in on something here. The tongues and being able to speak well is a gift that's given. Now, to be able to speak as well as any human being is one gift. To be able to speak as the angels is a gift that no human has. Paul's making this argument that, look, now if, you're, if you're the greatest speaker that ever lived... In fact, even greater than the greatest that ever lived, if you were as good as angels, which well, nobody could be, then without love, you still have nothing. He stretches it to that extent. If you had greater abilities than could ever be given, then you still would be nothing without love. If you had the prophetic powers and understandings and ministries and all knowledge, well, let's kind of unpack each of those. Prophetic powers are the ability to, uh, it's not tell the future, it is to preach. 
Uh, the idea of prophetic powers is to interpret Scripture and then to see how it works in today's world. So what did Scripture have to say about something and how would it be used in today's world? That is prophetic power. So what does God think on a particular subject and where we are today and the prophetic powers is to have that. There is also this issue of mysteries. Now mysteries within the church are treated in, in the ancient world a little bit differently than how we do them now. Today mysteries are shown on TV and in 30 minutes they're solved, right? Murder mystery, 30 minutes later, we all know who did it, that's right, and we have closure and we're done. Mysteries within ancient teachings don't truly have a full solution. They're meant to be given to us to give something to chew on and they present truth. But there's not a particular solution to them. I'll give you a couple of them. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. There's a mystery for you. Uh, there are many mysteries within Scripture, how the church is like a bride and a bridegroom. Christ being the bride, the church uh, is, excuse me, the, the church is the bride and Christ is the bridegroom. And how excited the church should be about meeting the, the bridegroom, right? So there are ways to perceive truth in the way these things exist. Uh, Paul doesn't say this is a mystery. He says it's a profound mystery, how the church as a bride and bridegroom. So there is truth within these things, and as we perceive and dwell into them, we learn about such things. This week, I was at the Board of Ordained Ministry, and we were interviewing new candidates that have just graduated from seminary, and we were testing them on their theological knowledge, and one of my colleagues threw out what I would call not the easiest question. Explain the Trinity for us. I was like, <laughs> great, I'm, I'm interested. I'm ready to hear this answer. I'll give you a clue. If you ever end up before the Board of Ordained Ministry and they ask you to explain the Trinity, start with, it's a mystery. Start right there. So my best explanation is going to perceive a portion of the truth of what the Trinity is, but to be able to explain it in its wholeness, you're going to be in a ditch in a hurry. Uh, if you say, uh, somebody said, it's like an egg, you know, you have the shell, uh, and then you have the, the center part, and then you have the yellow and the white, but they're all three one, but they're three different. I was like, uh, that's partialism. <laughs> How about water, steam, and ice? Oh, that's modalism, but, but keep trying, you know. So there are ancient heresies within all of these, but you can also perceive the Trinity this way. It's an example of community. It's an example of the community of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the church, us, and God. What it is to be in true community requires three. So God gives us the Trinity as an example of what community is. That's a mystery to then begin to perceive those things. But it's not something that can be solved. And here, what does it say in the Scripture? If you can perceive all of the depths of all mysteries, that is, could you perceive the depths of the deepest ocean, or can you perceive and sound the depths of an ocean with no bottom? Then you have that. And if you had all knowledge, and if you had the ability to be the greatest preacher, you could perceive all mysteries and sound them to their depths. If you knew all of this and you, you did not have love, you're nothing. Paul goes on, if you give away your possessions, if you have the faith to move entire mountains, if you have the faith to enter into things and you have changed the world, you have built monumental things, yet you don't have love, you're still nothing. And from this, Paul points out all of the places where we must have love in each of them. And then he goes on and says, even if you're the greatest ever, Without this, you don't know what it is to be Christian. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Doesn't keep records of wrongs. It moves from attributes to then doings. See, love's not just a noun of an emotion. It is a verb of doing. Now, strangely enough, in the doing, it does something in us. As we live out love, it begins to change us. It begins to make us into new people. Love isn't something that we just feel, but it is something that we do in the way we behave. And in that behaving, it then changes who we are. 
Paul is a very unusual character. If you remember early in his career, he was the best student. He had the best teachers. On the third day, he was circumcised. If you look at Scripture, you'll see Paul said, of a Jewish person, I was the most Jewish there could be. Of the best student, I was the best they ever had. Of all of it, I was at the very top of it. And what do I count it as? Trash. Rubbish. Of all the things that were the most pinnacle, without love, he realized he's nothing. Now remember, he went from the person who was persecuting Christians, right? Stoning Stephen to one who is talking about love. There is a transformation that took place in Paul. He moved from one state to another and was transformed. Now I believe that this scripture has a lot to do with transformation, and I'm going to go into why I think that, because there is an odd set of verse that is right here in the middle of it that just sticks out. As I read it, maybe it kind of, you, you kind of almost trip over it as you go. It is this verse about when I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Uh, did, you, did you notice that section? It's, it's almost kind of awkward. It's just like stuck in there. My bet is Paul didn't stick it in there by accident. My bet is it's a clue as to what is the transforming powers of these verses. That in living out love, we become loving. We are transformed by them. But when I was a child, I acted like a child. When I was a little boy, we used to have Thanksgiving meals. Uh, I'm sure you remember yours, the big table. We had it all set, tablecloths, napkins. And I would get iced tea at Thanksgiving. Now, mom and dad didn't make iced tea a lot, but at Thanksgiving, I would have iced tea. In fact, back then, we didn't really give tea and coffee to children too often. So, so I had tea. And, and, and as a child, I liked sweet tea. I still like sweet tea. If you want to know sweet tea or regular tea, sweet tea. I don't want to start any arguments in church like Chevrolet and Ford or sweet tea or non-sweet tea. These are things that may not be solved till end times. But I liked sugar in my tea. Now, when I was small, I would look and I would taste it and I'd go, Mom, it's not sweet enough. Would you pass me the sugar? And she would look and go, well, there's sugar in the bottom of your glass. If you would stir it up, your tea would be sweet. To which I thought, uh, no, if I stir it up, the sugar in the bottom is going to disappear. <laughs> and if there's no sugar in the bottom of this thing, the chance of it being sweet is gone. And so I kind of look around there. Is there somebody else in authority here I can appeal to who knows how this works? Brother, could you pass me the sugar? Mom told you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shh. If you stir it up, it's gone. Where does it go? Well, as adults, we all know this. This is called the ob object constancy. When children are small, they have object constancy. Why do they like peekaboo so much? Because you, when you disappear, you're gone. And then when you reappear, you're back. Well, this was the, the, the problem I was having. I was having problems with object constancy at that age, and I thought, well, if I don't see any sugar in there, I'm sure there's none in that glass. And then I grew up. And then I grew up. We were transformed by this growing up. We, we could be transformed by living out love. By living out love, we begin to be changed. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It's not boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. It endures all things. So there is this idea that this is the way we behave, and when we behave, maturity comes along with it. Which brings me to the question of the Scripture about Christ irritating all of His uh, hometown people. Now, I have to include this in the sermon because I read it, and if I don't include it in the sermon, some of you later, did you forget that Scripture, Patrick? No, I just didn't preach on it. Some people got that joke. Well, what, what, what's going on? What's the problem here with this particular scripture? Why are the hometown people upset about this? I, I believe it's because 
often we have the world figured out and we like how we have it figured out and we don't like anybody messing with how we got the world figured out. Even if it's going to be better, we don't want it different. And so they would prefer to have the world the way it was and Jesus was coming in and he was messing up their world. Now, there are some theories on learning which include this idea that we really begin to learn when we become really irritated. When the world messes with us, when teachers mess with us, when we are irritated, that's when learning really begins to set in. And until then, we're just kind of comfortable. I often say doctors have the greatest job in the world for sales because people don't buy until they're, till they're in pain. Think about it for a few minutes. You'll figure it out. So once you're in pain, then you're ready to buy. Just get me out of this pain. Well, Jesus comes in introducing pain. And what do they want to do? Let's get rid of the pain. Let's get rid of the thing that's having to require us to change because our worldview is fixed. We do not want it to be altered. Which brings me back to my story of iced tea. <laughs> What was really interesting about that is my mom, a loving, kind person, picked up my iced tea glass and stirred it up until the sugar was gone. Now, mind you, she did the right thing, but it irritated me so badly, I drank water instead. Did I taste the sweetness of the tea? No because I was too irritated, even though it was right there. It's the way we are all too often. Right before us is the sweetness of Jesus. But are we willing to taste it? So I have to finish up 1 Corinthians as, as we return back to that. It has an estiological interest in the way the scripture is written, written, which is a really fancy way of saying it's talking about heaven. It's talking about when everything ends. So there's this particular idea that when everything ends, there is a certain order to the way things are, and that is the way we are progressing and we are moving. And you need to understand that our life and where we are going is to be in the presence of God. It says it right there in the end. In the end, what happens? There is faith, hope, and love. It doesn't go on to tell you this, but two of those pass away, and they pass away for very particular reasons. Faith passes away because faith becomes sight when we're in the presence of God. And hope, what we hope for is replaced by the reality of being in heaven. So the need for faith goes away. The need for hope is replaced with reality. But what remains? Love. In the end, when we are in the presence of God, what goes with us, what isn't consumed in the fire on the way to the presence of God is love. So as we live love, it changes us. It does a work in us as we do a work in the world. And then we are made ready to be in the full presence of God. One final story, and I'll wrap this up. It's a story about a man who is sitting on a bluff overlooking his hometown. And as he is watching his own hometown, he's enjoying the afternoon, a stranger walks up and says, are you from there? And he says, yeah, yeah, I'm, it's my hometown. He said, well, can you tell me about that town right there? And he said, um, well, tell me about the town you're coming from. Because he was looking to relocate. He said, tell me about the town you're coming from. He goes, well, the people there are... They're not very nice. In fact, they're ugly. They backbite. They gossip about each other. They're terrible to one another. And it's, it's, just, it's just an awful place. He said, you'll find the same thing in that town. And, and he moved along. Later, a second person come up and this man said, hey, I'm looking to relocate here. Are you from here? And he says, yeah, that's my hometown. He says, can you tell me about that town? And he says, well, tell me about the town you're from. He said, they're wonderful giving people. They take care of one another. They live together in harmony. And they love one another. And he said, you'll find the same in that town. My prayer and hope for you and this church 
is may we engage in the process of loving so that we're made ready for the town we're going to. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy